I'm just going to keep your notes in red. I'm just going to go with it. The more, the more work on questions, the better, in my experience. <clears throat> Ready? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Welcome to another uh, very special episode of the Mo Show podcast. Tonight, I um, I'm very grateful to have Prince Khalid, uh, who is the founder and CEO of KBW Ventures. Prince Khalid is a prominent figure in the world of business and tech. He's an avid investor who supports entrepreneurs, sustainability, and green energy. Uh, Prince Khalid, thank you so much for coming on my show. No, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. How have you been? How have uh, how's the last 20 days? Are you we're 20 days into Ramadan now? How has the fast been going for you this year? Um okay, bismillah, alhamdulillah, salam rasulullah. Thank you very much for having me again. Ramadan is tough, I'll be honest with you. For a person who sleeps early uh, and eats early, my dinner is 6:30. Um so it's um it's a little um uh, work for me to get used to but um you know 20 days into it you get used to it pretty quickly um my uh, my system uh, is readjusting i'm working out in the afternoons rather than the mornings not as hard and everything so it's it's uh, it's working out well it's just that uh, the last 10 days are going to be the uh, the, uh, the, <laughs> the, push, the, the final, the final push. push exactly what's what's your secret like how what do, what do you do no in ramadan is tough i'll be honest with you because i i'm usually a one meal a day person uh, and i just have a smoothie and maybe a green juice uh, in the mornings um, and the afternoons this is your normal routine that's a normal routine and in, in ramadan you have to condense that into roughly six hours yeah. so between 6 p.m and 12 a.m um roughly um so I end up actually gaining weight because I have to eat a little later. Uh, and then I have to cram in as much nutrients as I can in those six hours. And just cramming them all in six hours really doesn't, it isn't uh, optimal. Hmm. So And then um, the water on top of all of that. You have to keep drinking water and everything. And then you're always, are you full? Are you not full? Are you full from the water? So it's, it's very confusing. It's challenging. So the next morning you'll find out that, yeah, you should have eaten more. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's okay, alhamdulillah. And it's, it's, again, you know, we've been doing it for all our lives, basically. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, we, we get used to it pretty quickly. And now with uh, eating a little earlier and just um, um, having a better routine for nutrition on what to eat on a late uh, um, uh, late in the evening makes more sense to me. Yeah. So um, I, I'm more of a uh, high carbs, uh, low fat type, type of um, 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 uh, nutrition. Mm -hmm. And if I do that later in the day, so 11, 30, 12, suhoor basically, I don't feel hungry the, the rest of the day. It carries you. It till... carries me. All right. Yeah, okay. the the, um, the protein would be maybe some peanut butter or anything just okay. so that uh, I can have some protein in there. And it just, it stays with me for a while. It's yeah. just thirst. Yeah, yeah. So thirst is that, the that challenge. Yeah. yeah. Um, in the early days of uh, me researching you, uh, it took very little time to find out that you are a vegan. Yeah. Something that it's... <laughs> Sorry, sorry about that, everyone. <laughs> no, no, I just I love the honest response. Um, <laughs> so I went vegan for two weeks, and I, I've said it on so many episodes, and 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 my wife is sick of hearing it. It was the best two weeks of my life. Yeah, I felt energy that I never thought existed. Mm -hmm. I thought I was going to be lethargic, tired, moody. I was the opposite of all of that. Yeah. Why did you go back to eating meat, Mo? I will never know. Sure. How did you manage to maintain it when you decided to be it? Uh, did you find it challenging to, to remain to remain a vegan? So uh, let's go back to the why did you go back to me? It's simple. Why you went back to me? It's it's, it's habit. It's, it's just the habit of w w how we've been raised uh, and and just rewiring our um, our brains and and um, and um, uh, replacing these cravings with something else. Yeah. And it was hard for me in the beginning too. I mean, I uh, I started pescatarian, so uh, it was mainly fish, and um, I wasn't really a big uh, big on dairy to be mm -hmm. honest. Um, but slowly cut uh, cut the fish out of the way, and then the, that worked out well. Um, I didn't really have that, that big of a problem. Um, the first reason why I went vegan was health wise. Um, I had high cholesterol and, and blood pressure. Um, high cholesterol uh, was treated with Lipitor and then Crestor because my joints started hurting and everything. Um, and that didn't work out too well for me. I mean, the doctor, I asked him anything else I can do. And I mean, the first thing the doctor says, well, no, because it's hereditary. So you have this for the rest of your life, um, which is this, which is the sad reality of, of 
of many doctors of pace. I'm not going to say all, but many doctors, um, at least doctors who understand nutrition. Okay. Uh, you can easily reverse a lot of these um, 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 pre, uh, 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 pre-prescribed pre um, genetic issues that, that some people have. Specifically cholesterol. Cholesterol, yeah. heart disease sometimes, yeah. um, um, diabetes. I mean, uh, some di forms of diabetes. You can easy, you, you can reverse them. That's, that's, that's proven through science. Um, but, um, I went vegan for about a good six or eight months. You know, everything went down, uh, got normal results. And the doctor says, great, the cholesterol is working, continue the cholesterol. I'm like, no, I haven't been on your medicine for six months. Like, no, no, that's impossible as well. Like, no, it's possible. I'm, I'm, I'm doing it. It's like, no, trust me. I don't think that's true. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're doing something else also. Are you exercising? And frankly, I wasn't exercising either. So, um, it's just it, eating, just, you wanted just, to... just to prove, uh, how, how strong, uh, Nutrition plays uh, in, in in one's life, and it literally reversed everything for Look me without that. exercise. Look at that. I literally just started exercising. Um, well, um, I've, I've been playing tennis uh, all my life, football or soccer uh, all my life, but then I stopped for a long time, and I got into um, weightlifting after I got into an accident. My right, I, my right side was paralyzed. Uh, from a jet ski accident, um, and I had to do physical therapy on my arm, on my leg, uh, for a good three years uh, for it to come back to normal. Um, normal being about 90, 95% normality. Um, but um, after that, I got into CrossFit. CrossFit was about, what, four years ago? Well, 2017, so about five, six years okay. ago. And I haven't looked back at since. You know, I absolutely love the sport. And the community is amazing. Um, it's grown big time. Oh, big time. It's, yeah. just, it's huge. It's and huge. the best thing about CrossFit gyms, there are no mirrors. So there are no people, you know. And all that garbage. Is that the no, secret? Huh? God, no, yeah. Because I'm sick of those mirrors in gyms. I mean, it's just God, it's so too annoying. much. <laughs> but yeah, so I started CrossFit about five years ago, and um, I've just been loving it ever since. And that's what helped your recovery from from your accident. No, the recovery was 1994. So really, uh, physical therapy helped me oh. a lot, um, and um, then just persistence on 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 exercising and doing these small small very minute. Um, 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 movements for specific muscle groups that control the leg. And I had to practically um, relearn how to walk. How, well, my left, my right leg had to practically relearn how to walk. Um, no, yeah, it was a big accident. It was 2000, no, sorry, it was 1994. Um, and I remember being, where was I? We were in um, south of France, um, Saint Tropez, I want to say. I th exactly, it was Saint Tropez. And I was on a jet ski. My sister was with me. She jumped off a jet ski and I was doing these crazy flips. And one time didn't work out too well. And I hit my head on uh, the jet ski and my right side was paralyzed. We, I had to get to medevaced to Marseille. Um, I still remember the doctor's name. I'm horrible with names and I remember his name, <laughs> oddly, Dr. Grizzly. Um, he was on vacation. He came back early for some reason. And um, uh, I had to have the surgery the next day, yada, 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 you know, three years later. Um, I got m most of my motor functions back. Alhamdulillah for yeah. that. Alhamdulillah. Uh, so timeline wise, yeah. uh, you, you took an interest in vegan and, and did that ultimately make you want to invest in companies like Beyond Meat and um, Upside Food, that whole cellular agriculture yeah. industry? Yeah. Is which where are we with that time? That's like? a fascinating question. So, um, um, <laughs> the, the chicken or the egg type exactly. of question, I know. Um, I actually met with Upside Foods, Memphis Foods, uh, Mef Mef Memphis Meats, uh, way before I, I met um, Ethan Brown from um, um, Beyond, Beyond Meat. Um, and um, just thinking about the um, the food. Uh, system and the food system uh, that that that's everywhere in the world, and how they're uh, approaching these uh, approaching um, having these solutions to this absolutely enormous problem, was an eye opener for me. Um, also combined with just learning about animal agriculture, learning about the food system, learning about how um, how food is actually brought to, to restaurants or brought to your home to your plate, um, just made a big. Um, it lit up a huge light bulb in my head and said, uh, there aren't many people investing in this area. And this was pre um, uh, Bill Gates and Richard Branson investing in these companies. So I was like, you know, this actually makes a lot of sense. Um, I think we should get into that. So I, uh, we, um, we established KBW Ventures, uh, maybe 2014 or so. Um, and we rallied uh, two or three of our partners then. 
And uh, we started talking about where's the best way to start investing. And sustainability uh, sounded like something that's, that's something that I'm really interested in. And there's a great opportunity there, then and now. Um, animal agriculture was a huge issue that it, uh, that can easily be um, alleviated with proper um, uh, policies uh, being governed by governments and implemented by governments, rather. Um, so uh, it, it really made a lot of sense for us to look into this industry. And um, the first thing that we did was we, uh, we invested in um, Beyond Meat, uh, pre-IPO, a few years pre-IPO. And it was a no-brainer. I mean, and it was honestly just the easiest way to to um, to have a replacement to uh, hamburgers um, or meat and chicken for that rather, because they had chicken tenders then, and now they do uh, again. Um, that's uh, that's a lot more sustainable. That's cruelty-free, and that's literally literally better for you. Yeah. Uh, and you know, all the things just uh, just added up uh, together, um, and that was our first investment. Our second investment was with uh, Memphis Meats. And uh, it was a um, it was a it was a leap it was a leap of faith honestly because I met with Uma Dr Uma uh, Veretti um, when was it uh, 2014 15 I want to say um, in not even in his office in one of his investors office in New York um, they didn't have an office and their office was shared with other um, other um, biotech companies in uh, in Silicon Valley. Uh, so I met them there, and he explained to me what uh, the idea was behind the famous five hundred thousand um, dollar um, seller agriculture meatball that was introduced way back in two thousand and eight. If you if you remember, uh, I think it was a scientist out of um, Holland, if I'm not mistaken. And just the process behind that just made a lot of sense because the, there's the the the, um, the amount of wastage and the amount of um, of um, of animal suffering and the amount of disease um, and um, and cost that uh, come with animal agriculture, you're mitigating ninety percent of that across the board uh, when you're talking about um, uh, growing uh, growing meat from cells in a very clean environment. So, and obviously not to, not to mention the um, um, the antibiotics uh, that are involved, the hormones that are involved in this. I mean, uh, scared meat. That's a term used today. Oh yeah, it's just, it's ridiculous. I mean, you've just today there was um, an article out of Wired that says the the U.S. Uh, has killed about, uh, if I'm not mistaken, eighteen to twenty uh, million uh, chickens uh, because of the there's a there's a spread of bird flu that's happening in, in the U.S. right now. Well, that's not that's not that's, that's not a mistake. No. The 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 uh, the the, um, the environment that they're in is primed to grow these type of um, diseases, yeah. and uh, we're just looking down the barrel of um, another di- disease other than COVID that'll make COVID look like a walk in the park compared to what's uh, coming uh, next. I mean, that's just the reality of it, and that's exactly where the 19, uh, 1919, 1918 um, uh, Spanish f- flu uh, yeah. uh, occurred. It happened from uh, from all these um, uh, factory farm um, um, environments, so it just made a lot of sense for us to start looking into this co- into these companies, start investing in, in these companies, and rather become and also become uh, ambassadors to these companies for this region. Because at the end of the day, we've, we were um, um, uh, we're importing ninety percent of our food, 85 percent of our food. It's a problem there. Food security is a huge issue. Yeah. And, and we dodged the bullet, a bullet when it comes to COVID days. I mean, we had the lockdown. We dodged a clear bullet. Um, uh, if lockdowns prolonged a lot longer than that, and uh, if uh, lockdowns internationally, forget here, if lockdowns internationally, I mean, they're already uh, affecting the supply chain. You've hear, you, you hear about the supply chain issue every every time you go on the news, the supply chain issues with uh, semiconductors and, uh, yeah. and, and whatnot, even shipping uh, containers and everything. There's a huge issue, yeah. issue with that. Now, um, uh, multiply that to um, to the food that uh, that people have uh, have on their on their uh, in their homes on their tables. Now you're uh, now you're affecting people personally. You're not affecting day people with, the, with with the, oh my god, my iPhone is delayed. Yeah. I'm not going to get it for the next yeah. three months. Who gives a damn? Yeah. You know, when it comes to food, and you're not going to be able to have food on your table for the next one, five, six days, two, three months. Then you have an issue. Prob- that's not something you need three times a day. Oh, yeah, yeah. There yeah. was an issue in the automotive sector, these mm-hmm. chips or something that, that delayed yes, exactly. cars coming through and then the price of cars in the region went up. But yeah, you can live with that problem. Yes. But not when it's a necessity. 
uh, that's alarming. Oh no, no, you have an issue, especially when you're when you're when you're importing ninety percent of your food. That's a red that's flag. Why, yeah. No, no, this is why. Um, this is I I applaud um, whoever is making these decisions uh, with with investing in vertical farming. That's super important. Mm-hmm. Fine, you're getting you're getting very selective uh, types of fruits and veg uh, from there. You know, tomatoes, um, 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 berries, and whatnot. Yeah, uh, yeah. Maybe lettuce and stuff like that. But you're not getting the the, the whole the whole rainbow, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, but sooner or later, you will. And when you do, you're gonna you're gonna alleviate a huge amount of pressure from the system. But until then, you have a huge uh, issue then. Now, fine. Let's just say that we invested in these companies, and they have all sorts of fruits and vegetables that you can grow on uh, in, in a vertical farming um, um, format. Uh, format. Okay. <clears throat> what happens when people want meat? <laughs> yeah, really. What happens? Because that will be an issue sooner yeah. or later. So when you have an issue that can easily be solvable and easily be scalable, and so much cheaper. And um, a lot more economically feasible when it comes to land use, when it comes to electricity use, when it comes to water use. It just makes a lot of sense to start investing in, in cellular agriculture. And we've been talking to a lot of companies and a lot of uh, industry uh, leaders here just to show them that this is one of the most important things that you need to start investing in uh, for the security of, um, of food security in the future. I know it's hot in the West, Europe, uh, U.S., uh, there's always a lag time between you know what we incorporate here uh, on a regional basis. How quickly do you see us as a region start recognizing what you're saying and taking it seriously to the point where people are actually backing it with their pockets and not just talking about it? So no, I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think it's going to take a longer time here than the U.S. I actually think it might. It'll, it'll be um, it'll be regulated here in the region and anywhere specific, but in the region mm-hmm. rather than the U.S. first. Uh, simply because there's a lot of um, a lot of hoops that you need to run th- run through uh, um, or hop through when it comes to um, to um, regulating this industry in the U.S. You have USDA, you have the FDA. It's um, it's, it's still um, very complex. Mm-hmm. Um, but look, uh, we've already seen Qatar uh, invest in uh, in um, in a company called Just. Um, just foods, or maybe it's just 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 yeah. yes. I, I yeah. yeah, I saw that. So uh, they invested a good chunk of it, and that's okay. That's alternative, not necessarily um, um, animal agriculture. Sorry, not necessarily cellular agriculture, but um, mainly it's um, it's um, um, eggs out of mung beans, which is great. Uh, so out of what mung beans? What's that mung beans? So these are specific beans that that are uh, grown specific in um, in China, okay. and uh, they're well known in, um, in in the Far East. Um, and they've, they've had them for thousands of years. And basically what you do is uh, they have a specific proprietary way that they turn mung beans into a form like egg. Uh, and actually you can make it at home if you, if you actually want to. It's a little more complex, but you can, but if um, it's a little more complex when it comes to just, mm-hmm. but when you can make it at home, if you've got fresh mung beans and you just soak them overnight and then you put them in a blender, put some water in there and literally, you, uh, and then heat them up, you literally have egg-like texture. Wow. And it's, it's, egg replacement. Oh, it's, it really is. It doesn't taste like egg unless you use black salt. I forget what the actual name of the black salt is, but there's a black salt that has a very um, sulfuric uh, smell to it, kind of like the, t- the the smell of eggs. Okay. And you just sprinkle that on there, and then basically your brain says, hell, this is this is egg <laughs> <laughs> in reality. Interesting. Um, but yeah, they, are, they also have... Um, um, this uh, cellular agriculture division that's that's being um, 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 sold to co- to consumers in uh, Singapore, and they've got the Singapore uh, government uh, backing from that, um, and it's been going well apparently. Uh, they're not disclosing obviously prices or anything because I think that's, that's they don't need to, uh, mm-hmm. they don't, they're not required to. Uh, but that's that that has been the biggest issue when it comes to cellular agriculture is um, is how do you when do you reach prosperity from um, a a, um, a piece of meat grown in a lab versus a piece of meat uh, that's been um, removed from an animal a slaughtered animal. Um, granted, it's not. Excuse the pun. It's not uh, apples to apples comparison because you already have uh, this industry is heavily um, subsidized by the government. It is. Yeah. yeah. So there's not necessarily an apples to apples comparison, uh, but still they've come way, way down. Uh, and I think um, if I'm not mistaken, we've reached about, I mean, uh, let me see. In the last three years, it was triple digits. And right now we're in the double digits. 
so when it comes to so if, if I were to um, to make it easier for people to comprehend what that means, a piece of meat would uh, a prime piece of meat would maybe cost about fifteen twenty dollars a pound. Uh, cellular agriculture would be about forty to fifty now, so it'll, it'll a little more than double. Um, compared to two or three years ago, where it cost five hundred dollars, compared to five oh, wow. years ago, where it cost thousands of dollars, wow. like five, like five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars. So scalability pound. has yeah. been... so scalability has really come down, and it really comes down to the feed, the medium that these cells are grown in, uh, that replicates um, uh, it being uh, it replicates these uh, cells uh, what they eat in um, or what they feed off of rather in um, in an animal uh, environment. Um, so it, it it really is about a matter of time, yeah. and honestly, I just see it being. Honestly, I think this year we'll see it on a plane, fish Maybe, or wow. fish or uh, or uh, land mammal. We'll see it on a plate in the U.S. I'm not talking about Singapore, God bless them, yeah. but I'm talking about the U.S. and in Europe. I'm talking about the U.S. first. Mm-hmm. So yeah. to enter like mainstream, to, yeah. to kind of have their foot in the door. I, I think Qatar will probably be one of the one of the leading countries that will have uh, sell, sell ag, um on, on their plates uh, very soon. Uh, the UAE um, created um, um, the Food Sustainability Ministry, um, uh, Her Excellency Maria, Maria Malmheri, an absolute rock star. Uh, she knows she knows everything that she's talking about when it comes to sustainability, when it comes to food, when it comes to cell, cell agriculture, and when it comes to vertical farming and and um, and um, um, and the entire industry that, that falls around uh, uh, food security. Uh, we've been in talks with her for a long time. Um, and uh, we've seen such an, an amazing support when it comes to um, uh, when it comes to these uh, co- these countries and these specific industries and these companies within these countries backing uh, these um, uh, uh, this technology, which is in the biotech field. Do, do we have something similar to that under our Ministry of Agriculture? Yeah. Uh, anything along the lines of sustainability efforts uh, similar to what they have in the UAE? There has been a committee. That's been formed, but uh, a short answer, no. Um, a longer answer, not yet. You don't just invest in in food companies. Yeah. You, you know, I would imagine you invest in in in, in uh, companies across certain sectors. Mm-hmm. Um, is there a common denominator of what you look for in yeah. companies when you do invest? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean. Um, um, one thing we're we're not into public companies. Uh, we're definitely into private uh, private equity or venture capital rather. Uh, so early stage companies. So uh, we invest anywhere in the range from uh, seed, sometimes pre seed, but seed round all the way to Series B, maybe Series C. Uh, on if, you, if we're stretching it. Um, but we look at entrepreneurs on how well they know the industry, how well they know the company, uh, how well they know their numbers. Mm-hmm. Uh, super important. Um, how passionate they are to the to um, uh, to, to the issue that they they want to solve. How realistic is it for them to solve this issue uh, the way that they're solving it? Mm-hmm. Um, and you, you'd be surprised about how many pitches we'd get um, in a week, and how many people just don't understand their numbers, but they're just passionate about it, and they say, "Well, invest in me because I'm just passionate about it." Yeah. It's not enough. No. So um, and we get that a lot here, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, we do get a lot of amazing companies, but valuations here are are uh, are through the roof. Valuations are in the U.S. through the roof, also, but they are they already have that market to back it at least. It's not justified here. It's not justified here yet, in my opinion. So other people are investing in that, and uh, they're doing an amazing job. God bless them. Uh, but uh, personally, we're not investing um, into, into any companies here, uh, other than maybe a handful. We've invested in four or five companies here, uh, a little less actually, two or three companies, and we've walked away from two more. That's why we said five. Um, but uh, we're super bullish about the industry. It's just that uh, we're just looking for uh, the right sector. So we looked at um, um, fintech, so overvalued. I think it's because of um, it's such a such a new uh, industry here, and it's really really needed. Um, and I think they have that backing uh, because you have a lot of um, a lot of public companies. Public companies meaning government companies backing uh, co- uh, organizations like Munchat um, and other um, organizations that are um, putting one-to-one investments into companies that find um, uh, funding. So if they find uh, $100,000 funding, they're going to match that funding, which is a great, which is a great way to, uh, to, to uh, supercharge the, uh, the early stage industry. Um, 
and I'm 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 100 for that. It's just that it creates a um, a, a over overvaluation that I'm not necessarily the biggest fan of. Uh, but that that does not um, um, take away any of the credibility of these companies. Are there entry points that we're comfortable in? Are there entry points that we're not comfortable in? Um, and frankly, there are many entry points that we're not comfortable in. Um, and uh, for the two or three companies that we invested in, we're very comfortable with them. I mean, I mean, 360 Views was one of the companies we invested in here. Super company doing such an amazing job. Um, uh, they're doing a lot of the, the um, uh, 360 um, 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 broadcasting of, uh, of uh, sports events. So whether it comes to um, the wrestling event, whether it comes to the marathon that we just did, uh, whether it comes to, to um, uh, the Super Cup, for example, you get to see these 360 uh, environments in the locker rooms, for example, on the pitch, from the, um, uh, the the viewpoint of the referee, for example. Such an amazing company. Where is the camera? Is it is it like floating? Is it like a spider cam? Or? So no, it's actually worn on one on, on either selective uh, players or, sele- or um, the referee, or even if it's an event like um, a wrestling event, it'll be something on, on top, and okay. then it'll just uh, give you a, a 360 view so you'd you'd have to wear a vr headset okay. but then you'd literally be living actually also um um concerts so it's perfect for concerts too so you can feel that you're actually in the yeah. middle of a concert yeah. um we've had that for not necessarily a concert but we had that for our um our uh, lifestyle enhancement conference that we did in in real uh, this year in 2019 um Super successful, mm-hmm. um, and it's, it's niche it's v- for sure. But a lot of NBA NBA um, um, teams are carrying it. Um, football teams are carrying it. So it's it's carrying it. It's getting um, it's getting momentum international line here. You know, what I, I think I don't know if you agree with me or not, but I, I see um, teams selling tickets for people who aren't there so they can attend virtually via that 360 degree cam. Mm-hmm. It'll be like you're there, you put your VR on and your courtside seats at a Celtics game. You're creating a brand new industry for people who are not there to be there. It's just fantastic. That's uh, that's disrupting. It really is, yeah. it really is. And, and, and thanks to companies like, uh, I've never thought I'd thank Meta, but I'm gonna thank Meta just for the <laughs> VR headset and that's about it. <laughs> Facebook, if anyone doesn't know what Meta is, um, but um, for the the Oculus Quest, I guess it's called Meta now. Yeah, it is. Um, but yeah, so thank you for those companies that are having these uh, these VR headsets. Uh, you can literally feel like you're part of the industry right now. It's, it's fascinating. Since you touched on Meta, yeah, is it the future? That no. whole verse, that universe, uni not, metaverse. Not, no, 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 no. To me, not anytime soon. Okay. I mean, I've seen, um, I've seen just the. Um, the absurdity of of um, of all the announcements that were made simply because they know they're plateauing. Um, a lot of the Gen Zs and Millennials are walking away from Facebook. All the only thing you're only people are on Facebook are boomers. Correct. So it's uh, it's pretty uh, it's pretty hard to sustain that um, that uh, that uh, that market. So they're looking into new newer uh, markets, and I think um, it's it's just it's just not there yet. And I'm not saying it won't make it anytime soon. Um, well, I'm not saying it's not making it's not going to make it at all. I'm just saying it's not going to make it anytime soon. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've seen their first rollout uh, that that Meta had, and it was an absolute joke. Um, um, so uh, I think I think maybe in the next seven to ten years, maybe you'll see something come out of there. Uh, but right now, um, I think they're just um, capitalizing from the uh, the hype that you're getting from NFTs, from, from the hype you're you're getting from uh, from Web three. Uh, you're getting a lot of that hype, um, and they're riding that wave rather than just creating something on their own. Looking at Facebook's uh, stock price, it had a high of 372 a year ago from today. Yeah. Um, a little less, like eight, nine months ago, and it's down to, to 200. So even the stock didn't react to that rebranding of Facebook to Meta. Oh, and it shouldn't. It shouldn't really react positively at all because a stock price needs to react. Uh, to how the fundamentals of the company is doing, and ten billion dollars um, of uh, of value, sorry, ten billion dollars of revenue has been wiped off of uh, Facebook's books simply because of uh, Apple and Google's um, um, reinterpretation of how um, advertisers are going to start making money. 
So that's, that hit them pretty significantly. And we've seen that this year on how hard it, it hit them. Um, so, uh, and, and then to the day, that's, that's their bread and butter is, 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 is advertising. Maybe they're going to start making money other ways uh, in the near future. But for now, uh, that's their bread and butter. And that's why their stock price has been hammered. I mean, they should be hammering a little more for all the privacy issues that they've had and all the manipulation that they've had and everything. And that's a whole other kind of worms that I'm more than happy to talk about in another time, maybe. Yeah, he's been, um, he's been in hot water. Zucker, I mean, yeah, Zucker and he Bird. should. Honestly, he should be. Uh, the company hasn't been run the way it should be run. Uh, and they're definitely using a lot of manipulation, a lot of um, um, not too honest uh, methods to uh, to uh, to capitalize uh, for their shareholders. I think their customers need to be their priority, not their shareholders. Yeah, totally. Uh, let's switch gears. Um, yeah. Prince Khaled, into you uh, head or you are the president of SFA, Saudi Sports Federation. Yeah. Um, I was on the website a few days ago, and uh, one of the missions or the missions of uh, this uh, movement uh, or entity, let's call it, is to keep the population moving. Uh, there's a bunch of KPIs of you know getting Saudis outdoor and being more active and leading a healthier lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, what can we see or what can we anticipate to see from the initiatives done by SFA, and do you see them being sustainable? I know there's a bunch of questions there, but mm -hmm. we can take it one by one. No, so the SFA is um, the Sports for All Federation has been um, has been there for for years, for maybe 15, 20 years. Oh, it was there? It yeah, existed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It, was, it was called the Mass Participation Federation. Now, granted, that does sound like a name out of Nazi Germany, but <laughs> <laughs> we, had to, <laughs> we had to change the name pretty, pretty, pretty damn quickly when we went out. Like your first order of business, <laughs> name change, please. 100%. Actually, <laughs> actually yes. Um, so, yeah, when Princess Anima was uh, was uh, was part of that, and then she, uh, obviously, she's our um, ambassador in, in, in the U.S. right now, and she asked me um, if I was open to uh, to um, to heading the the federation. Then she asked um, uh, Prince Abdelaziz, and Prince Abdelaziz was was more than open to it uh, because prior to that he had asked me to to um, uh, to head the um, fitness and wellness federation, which actually married married very well with the Sports for All Federation. So um, I was more than happy to, I was honored to, to be honest, just to serve just to serve my country in any capacity that I can, would, which would be amazing. And especially to serve Prince Abdelaziz. You know, I've known him for more than 10, 15 years now and uh, an absolute gentleman, um, loves, uh, loves sports and loves what he does with a passion that you can see it in his eyes every single day that he's at work. Granted, they're tired eyes, God bless him, because he works so damn hard. Um, but um, if anything that if you can do anything, we'd, we'd support him blindly. You know, uh, such an amazing human. However, going back to the SFA, um, yeah. So the first order of business was changing it to the Sports for All Federation, which would, worked out beautifully. And then we had to have a logo change also with the new with the new um, um, with the new name change. Um, and then we started working on um, on how to make. Uh, the sports for all, not necessarily sustainable, but make it into a, an entity that's vital for the continuation of, of, of a healthier and happier community, um, or even building upon having a healthier and happier community. Um, and we say that intentionally, because in order for you to be happier, we believe you have to be healthier. Um, and healthier happens through a number of ways. Active, act, uh, being active. So 150 minutes a week is our uh, guideline, which is in line with the WHO and um, through proper nutrition. Now, obviously, that doesn't mean go vegan. Uh, I don't have a <laughs> I don't have a, an underlying agenda to tell people to go vegan. But, but Disclaimer. But, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Because uh, I will fail every single time. But what I do um, push people to do is, is have a healthier and ha have have a balanced lifestyle. And that's all that you can ask for, because at the end of the day, people are are not going to go 100% vegan, and that's just the reality of it. And we we can discuss that another time. Um, but going back to the SFA, that's the, the the philosophy that we're behind: having a balanced lifestyle through nutrition and through um, um, uh, and through activity is what we're striving for. And then we started analyzing the sports pyramid, because um, if we're going to be at the bottom, which is basically um, getting getting the community active, grassroots activities, getting them active. That's the best way to start feeding into the, um, into the, uh, into the elites, um, all the way to the top of the pyramid. Um, and where do we start? We, we figured that we have to start with the communities through schools. So 
we have after schools programs right now uh, and you've seen them i think uh, through a lot of our um, um social media um um, um uh, social media ads that were that were showing uh, that we've taken over 13 schools from the for when we've partnered with the ministry of education to take over 13 schools um after hours and using them as a community center so a type of a ymca type of approach uh, to to these neighborhoods so that they would have a place to go that's relatively very affordable 10 10 reals 15 reals um, per day um, I think per month actually per month yeah yeah we're, we're not here to make money to be honest four bucks you're talking for we're, US dollars. we're not talking about making money what we want to do is get people more active um, we're transitioning that into a per month um, scheme. A payment scheme. Uh, right now, we're doing a lot of free, uh, free to go, and we're testing the market of how it'll be for them to have um, um, a daily rate. How well, how how are they going to be receptive to having a weekly rate or a monthly rate, or or or, or that uh, for that matter? But uh, we've done 13 schools with a partner with a partnership with the Ministry of uh, of Education, and it's going to be going great. And we've seen about six to eight thousand uh, participants right now um, uh, coming uh, to these schools and doing all sorts of activities, from uh, from culture activities to physical activities to um, to mindfulness and wellness uh, to uh, to simply just having the mother and father or the brother and sister or the uncle or the grandfather be there and 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 even participate with them um, in in some in some fashion. So we're getting the entire community active in these uh, community um, after uh, after school programs in schools. Uh, what we're doing also is doing uni- universities. Universities have uh, huge um, um, facilities, uh, sports facilities that are dormant, collecting dust, literally collecting dust. Had a feeling. Yeah, collecting dust. So what we've, uh, what we've told them is that we'll take them over for you. We'll do all the maintenance for you. Uh, but you have to open them up after hours for the community, not just the school. You have to open up for the community and we'll take care of everything for you. Very receptive. So we have about uh, six uh, universities. Um, Jeddah is, uh, is, is among the cities that we're in, Taif, Nasar al Medina, Lahsa, Riyadh is as part of that. Fantastic. Yeah. So we're, we're starting these um, in, in universities and even على فكرة, the, um, uh, the school programs and then Hafr al Batan. So we're not just in uh, the, big the big cities. cities. Yeah. yeah we're, we're, we're literally in all the small cities also. Fantastic. Those are two programs that we're doing, obviously. So obviously we have uh, the marathon that we just threw, um, uh, what, um, uh, last March? Yeah, March a 5th. couple months, yeah. Super, uh, it was super successful. More than 10,000 participants. Uh, the 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 the, um, the first fully uh, uh, sanctioned uh, marathon uh, by the World Athletic Federation um, uh, was um, was in Riyadh. And now we're working out uh, having one in Jeddah, al fikra um, we're finalizing that, uh, inshallah, مع الأمارة, uh, very soon, and we'll announce that hopefully in the next couple of months uh, so that people can prepare for the marathon in Jeddah Marathon. Mm-hmm. Uh, it'll be either a marathon, half marathon, we'll figure that out um, uh, when it comes to the venue and, and where people are going to run. Um, but that's part of it. Lifestyle Enhancement Conference is a huge part of it, too. Uh, we're teaching people. Uh, and um, doctors about the importance of nutrition and the importance of physical activity and the importance of of combining them together to have a um, an optimal lifestyle. Um, um, so our customers are wellness, uh, fitness, and wellness and wellness um, 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 individuals and um, and companies. More importantly, we also have doctors. And, and uh, pre-med students who are uh, participating in this and uh, them participating in the conference will be accredited to their um, uh, to their um, 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 uh, graduation to their graduation program. program. Yeah. So we have a buy-in from the Ministry of Health also. So we have all sorts of... Um, I like how it's interconnected, by it's, the way. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So we're, 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 we don't want to do... We understand that we're not going to do everything on our, ourselves. We understand that we need partners to for us to succeed for the country to succeed in having a healthier and and, and, and happier um, um, society. And having all these uh, success partners are imperative for our success. Mm-hmm. And the most important thing is just thinking about this organization. It'll never, it'll never be self-sustaining. Uh, we, we, will never, we will always be a cost center uh, for, for, the, um, uh, for the country. But the, thing, but the reality is through multiple studies that we've read, um, for every one dollar that you pin, that you put in for um, uh, for nutrition or activity, 
um, or for, to, to promote healthy and active uh, lifestyle, you get six dollars back in savings uh, for from um, medical. from medical issues that uh, for, uh, medical issues that you would be you would be prevent yeah. uh, from from getting. Yeah. So th- the return is there. Mm-hmm. It's just that you have to understand there's a social return on investment rather than an actual return on investment. Right. Yeah. yeah. What I'm seeing is a lot more. I don't know if you guys work closely with the municipality, but a lot more walkways, a lot more playgrounds, mm-hmm. a lot more parks. Mm-hmm. I know King Salman Park is scheduled to open in Riyadh soon. Yeah. And um, that's, I think that's our first real Hyde Park, Central Park equivalent in oh, Saudi yeah. Arabia. Oh, yeah. We, we, we have a deal with, um, we've signed with the, the Ministry of Municipality and Housing uh, to, uh, to, to start activating public parks. Uh, we've done uh, three parks uh, as a pilot project. One in Dammam, one in Riyadh, and one in, um, in, um, in Asir. And it's been really, really successful, alhamdulillah. Yeah, yeah. so it, it, it's happening. It's just that uh, we're going through a trial and error um, um, way. So we did, um, we pushed the envelope on how much we can push uh, people to start uh, becoming active in public parks. And the first 50 to 60% of the time that we thought we'd get more people, we failed miserably in because we found out that uh, we were pushing people to start to to uh, to become active in the wrong times, on the wrong times. So now we're working out um, uh, these kinks and now we're, we're, uh, we're, co- we're going into this uh, with a whole new plan. And we did it in Jeddah, uh, Friends of Jeddah Park, we called yes, it. Yes, of course. Yeah. I remember that. Super successful, yeah. alhamdulillah. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I had um, Prince Abdul Aziz bin Turki, Minister of Sport, over uh, on uh, episode 55. And um, he mentioned that... Uh, he, he, beat, ha- he beat me to that number because be- five was my mother's no- favorite number. So was 55 it? would have been perfect. Oh, my God. Damn it. <laughs> well, if I knew what I knew <laughs> no, now, <it's> then... <laughs> um, he told me that he was given a target yeah. um, to have 100 functioning federations. Yep. He's at 93 today. Yeah. Growing up, uh, I was born in 83, so growing up in the 80s and 90s, it was almost frowned upon culturally, yep. socially, to pursue a career in football. I wanted to, my dream was to be goalkeeper for Saudi football team. Yeah. And just like, you know, people in my family, like, you, you don't want to do that, you know, be a doctor, be a lawyer. I definitely, I definitely didn't get be a podcaster. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you see the landscape changing where if somebody wanted to pursue a career in professional sports, that is less frowned upon now? So I went to... Um... I went to uh, one of our programs, um, um, one of our partners in a school after hours with, in, with an academy. I'm sorry, uh, Sports SA, that's their name. Um, and um, I, I was sitting down with the, the fathers and the mothers and everything. We were talking and um, the vast majority of them was like, Inshallah, tennis. I hope he, I think he'll become um, a good handball player. Uh, one of them actually said golf. Oh, wow. So it's actually, if, to me, that, that was not, not, not necessarily a culture shock, but a shock that the culture has reached this, uh, this verdict that sports is definitely somewhere, an economy, um, sports is definitely going to build upon the economy uh, to, for success. And we're seeing this in multiple um, industries, but in sports and in Saudi. And we were, I was very shocked at that. And yeah. um, I went to the team. We said, listen, uh, we have a partner uh, called Nielsen. They do a lot of um, surveys all around the world, one of the most reputable companies in the world. And we are, and now we're asking them to start asking people, uh, uh, additionally to the questions that we're already asking people um, uh, about the sports industry and how uh, favorable would they be? Would they feel having their um, their their siblings or their kids uh, into this industry in some fashion? Not necessarily a goalkeeper, not necessarily a a, a player, but maybe a business owner, maybe a yeah. gym owner, uh, maybe an academy owner or something. And uh, I'm really interested to see the uh, the, uh, the the feedback from that. Yeah. Times are changing. Oh, big time! Yeah. <laughs> okay, I noticed that there's a federation in surfing. Yeah. That was pretty cool to see. I have a cousin of mine, Mishael al He's an avid surfer. Mm. Um, and he's been to the facility in Dubai. Yeah. And uh, whenever he's there, he, you know, he ensures to 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 go to it. And um when I told him that I'm having you on, he uh he's like, just can you pick his brain on this? Yeah. Um, with technology creating waves sure. across the world, um, and that tech not being uh, in the Middle East at all, yeah. and with your background in technology, do you see us making any moves to attract surfing to our part of the world? 
So I can, it's funny. Um, the um, the uh, the, feder- the the surfing federation actually came. To, well, uh, practically all the federations came to us uh, talking about how we can partner with them. But the fed, but one of the interesting was ones were the um, winter games one. Yeah, super interesting. I absolutely love them. And the uh, surfing uh, federation. And actually, I asked them that specific question. Literally that question. I mean. Um, what can we do to start bringing this type of technology here in the Middle East so that we can have um, these um, these waves so that people can, one, enjoy, two, practice? Um, and I was shocked to know that um, I think they have, um, I'm sorry if, if I got the number wrong, but they have maybe 15 to 20, uh, maybe to 25 uh, different sports in the uh, surfing federation. Only two of them require um, uh, waves. Okay. Yeah. So, or maybe two or three or four, but the vast minority of it uh, need waves. So that's not necessarily their um, their um, their bread and butter. However, there's still that minority that they want to uh, they want to um, cater to, and I understand that. And how the, how are they going to do that? So I asked them about what different technologies we can bring uh, to the table because I don't I'm, I'm not sure if Dubai has that, and if they do, I'd love to see it because I haven't seen it uh, other than just in um, some. Water parks internationally. I think I've seen it in LA. Um, this huge log is is being pulled and and it has this slanted um, um, apparatus that pushes the wave and yeah, then it yeah. becomes a wave. <laughs> See, yeah, with like five hundred people in the pool. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I've seen that, and I'm not sure. One, is it economically feasible? Two, where would we put it? Definitely not Riyadh. So I'd definitely put it somewhere in Jeddah. I'd definitely put it somewhere in in, in the east uh, in the eastern western provinces. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would love to see that. It's just that it's it's an expense, and it's a huge expense. And I think it's about seven to uh, maybe five to seven to, to eight million uh, riyals. The wave making, the wave making machine. Uh, machine. Oh, yeah. Wow. So I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure uh, how that, how we can um, pitch that, and how successful we would be at pitching yeah. that to the higher ups to to getting uh, to getting um, the okay for us to use our budgets mm-hmm. uh, to fund something like this. I would love to see it. I'll be honest with you, uh, because I just think that it'll definitely get more people to start practicing and starting having fun for for, the, for that matter. Because at the end of the day, our our mandate is is just to get people more active in a fun and more in a sustainable way. And then they will feed into the federations, and the federations will take it from there. And then that's their issue with uh, the um, with the Saudi um, Olympic Committee mm-hmm. on how to sustain that and how to grow that and how to make them into elites. Um, so I, I'd be interested to know how they would um, tackle that. I mean, for our side, we're just interested in um, in, in, in supporting federations in as much as we can to, to get as many people involved into that sport as possible. Yeah, yeah. Exciting times ahead for uh, federations and sports in Saudi Arabia, and, and a huge responsibility. And a huge responsibility. Yeah. Well, you would know. Yeah. You would know. Uh, I've always believed that it's easy to knock off an, an innovative product. Mm-hmm. But an innovative system or a business system is much harder to replicate. For example, like I look at, um, okay, so NFL, New England Patriots. Yeah. They just seem to be good every year. They have a system in place where if you walk through the door. Tennessee Titans. T- yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So so for the sake of me having uh, graduated from Boston yeah. and, you know, that's my, uh, my background, we'll go with the Patriots. <laughs> If you're okay with that, <laughs> sure, go ahead. Um, but the the point I'm I'm trying to make is um, uh, they attract uh, the best players because they have an amazing system, and yeah. even average players become great. I mean, Tom Brady was a third string yeah. quarterback that yeah. became many people say the greatest of all time. All time. So, what do you think we can do in Saudi uh, in terms of innovating or creating a system that is successful uh, for people to you know get the best of the best? All right, so that's a super important question, and that really feeds directly into what we do as the Sports for All Federation. We are agnostic when it comes to what kind of sport um, to do. Uh, we're not focused, even though the vast majority of people are really in- in- uh, interested in uh, football, um, walking, uh, swimming is actually pretty big, um, basketball is pretty big. But where we turn a blind eye into what um, uh, sports um, um, are in right now, simply because we understand that the in sports that were happening in the last 10, 20, 30 years 
are basically shadowing the sports that people want to do, but don't have the opportunity to do because the other sports are just overwhelming, um, are um, overpopulated with, with interest. So a lot of the surfers don't get a free, um, don't get a fair um, uh, chance when it comes to having opportunity to participate in or, or practice their favorite sports, skateboarding. They don't have the, the, the opportunity for it. Um, so we focus on all sports. So now, um, going back to your question, it's a two-tiered question. So what can we do to help um, get these elites out there a little more? If you ask us honestly, is getting the foundation or getting the, um, yeah, well, getting the foundation as broad as possible and as many people as possible participate into this, um, into the bottom part of the, of, of the pyramid so that you can literally have some people um, um, grow out of uh, being um, a, a grassroots enthusiast and start getting into it a little more professionally. And um, His Excellency Badr al Gavi hit on this perfectly. And I remember a meeting that we had. I forget with whom. I want to say with a sports with a, with an ambassador. I forget which ambassador it was. But he gave he gave an, an example of um, of Australia. And I'm going to butcher the numbers, but essentially it's it's this. They have uh, the number one sport in Australia uh, is in, uh, of, of interest is swimming. And they have about, if I'm mistaken, a few million, uh, um, maybe, um, yeah, a few million um, registered into the Sports Federation for Swimming. Wow. And the, the ones that make it uh, to, uh, to become uh, professional are in the hundreds of thousands. Um, that translated into six medals into the last or the before last um, um, uh, Olympics that, that uh, um, uh, Australia participated in. So literally think about it for a second. You're talking about a, a segment <clears throat> of a, sub, a, a subsegment of a subsegment of a subsegment of a segment. That's grassroots. So we're not, we're talking about getting as many people as possible Participating in this exam in the, into this specific sport, so that you can get one or two elites out of there. You're not going to get it from uh, five people. You're not going to get it from from a, a thousand people participating. You're, the odds are just going to be uh, overwhelming against yeah. you. You yeah. have to get as many people as possible participating into the sport, so that you can have a good functioning elite program. Mm -hmm. If not. You're just not gonna. You, you're gonna have what what we're already having right now in in, in KSA, yeah. and that's the real. And this is what uh, Prince Abdelaziz sees, and this is what he said. He sees with the importance of grassroots activities. You have to grow it as much as possible so that you can get uh, the, the elites coming out of the um, uh, the uh, the um, the foundation yeah. of, um, of of, of uh, sports interest. But my quick calculation calculated that for every medal, 150,000 swimmers, yeah. if a million were registered, 150,000 swimmers were, was the value of a medal. Um, he spoke to me about how in Portugal, when he was there with the, with the um, football team last World Cup, he was talking to one of the federation heads over there and he was asking them, how many clubs do you have there? Mm -hmm. There are 10 million people in, or the population of Portugal is 10 million. They have 850 clubs. Saudi is double that with 150 clubs, sorry, or 170 clubs. Okay. So he's like, we need to be in, in the thousands of clubs so yeah. that, and Portugal, I don't know if you noticed, but they just climbed the FIFA world rankings in the last two decades. Mm -hmm. Cristiano Ronaldo is a product of the seed that was planted many years ago. Yeah. And and it's not just uh, Cristiano Ronaldo, like there were some huge other names, Luis Figo. I mean, mm -hmm. they they are they are top five ranked today, yeah. but it's because participation volume in participation really does um, translate to quality of produce, end of the day. A hundred percent. We were in Germany 2018, and we did the same exercise, but we looked at uh, the German industry, and then we looked at—I um, forget the name of the of, of the football team in Frankfurt. I think it's Frankfurt. Yeah, Frankfurt something. So, so it's a German, it's a German name. I, I wouldn't even attempt to uh, to, to uh, <laughs> give it a shot. To no. give it no, no, <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be allowed back there. Um, so what we found out is that there's their uh, their a football Intracht. Entracht, there you go. Okay, Entracht Frankfurt. I just wanted to say. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, so sorry. Go ahead. No, no problem. <clears throat> so what we found out is that the most um, successful 
club over there is that's uh, that's uh, that uh, football club, but that started with um, with a um, um, with a grassroots activity that was not uh, necessarily football in the beginning. It was just the in the the, um, the the city participating into um, altogether into um, into um, uh, different types of sports. And one of them that came out was was um, the the football club, and that football club became so successful that that started funding the other programs that they're doing. More importantly, they're actually open to the community. So that um, when we went there at night, I think it was eight eight p.m. There were it was open free for the public to go and start playing football um, or another sports in their fields. Why? Because that is um, the philosophy of success. This philosophy of success isn't, isn't just Nadi al Hilal, Nadi al Ittihad, Nadi al Ahli, and just close environment and not allowing other uh, the community to be part of it. And that's what we're seeing right now with with clubs here now. Alhamdulillah, we're seeing al Hilal, we're seeing other parts of um, other parts of um, the Saudi um, club environment getting the um, uh, the uh, the community involved yeah. into their facilities. And we're, that's that's what we need more of. And as soon as we see more of that, you'll get breakout uh, clubs from within these clubs that are creating their own uh, clubs. And then you'll have a huge Division C uh, league. And then you'll have a big Division B, Division A, and then the Premier League. Yeah. And that's what you're seeing right now happen slowly but surely. And with, with the new announcement that uh, Prince Abdulaziz and well, the Ministry of um, Sports through Amir Abdulaziz, did with um, with um, uh, uh, the process of how to start an academy and the process of how to start a club. Now it's just easier than ever for them to to start doing that. Yeah. And they get support, financial support. They get, oh yeah, they do. Yeah. And and <clears throat> hopefully that financial support will lessen um, throughout the years to becoming zero, so that it'll be a community uh, run um, 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 entity yeah. rather than just a, something that needs to be supported by the government which really needs to end up sustainable yeah something yeah yeah a bit of a somber switch but um in in me uh doing a bit of uh research on you i i saw something i read something that um is also close to my heart um and it's um it's the whole situation of zoos and and um i don't know why people feel like it's okay and so natural for us to lock up animals uh, only for you know humans to pay to go and visit them. I'm against it. Blackfish was a documentary that kept me up for days. Yeah. Um, you know where I'm going with this. Um, how how do you in, in interpret it? Like when did it start really being an issue to you? And uh, is there something that can be done about it? I have a great, that's a great question. So about four years ago, five years ago, we started. Uh, we partnered with a company out of New York uh, that does um, um, what, in effect, would would have been uh, a virtual zoo. So right now you have this amazing technology with these uh, with these curved screens without any glasses, but you have these curved screens, huge. I and mean, we're talking about um, um, movie theater uh, size screens that. Um, uh, that people would walk into this uh, this environment, um, and it would be one room, and then you'd walk into another room, and then through uh, through one, from one room to one room, there's another experience in the middle, and it would be the entire thing would be a beautiful experience all the way to the end. Um, and one of them would be, for example, um, uh, what would a polar bear uh, look like if they were in their in its environment? And it would be so realistic and so high res that you'd literally feel that you're in there, especially with cold air blowing and everything. It'll be so realistic. Another one would be under underground, uh, underwater. Sorry, um, and in, the lights would shut off, and they'd have three D audio to where that you would hear, essentially you would feel. But you would hear uh, the whales um, uh, communicating with their 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 uh, their, their sonar. Um, yeah. I forget what's it called. Sorry, but the way that they would communicate, um, and you'd you'd hear the the noises behind you, next to you, above you, below you, into this amazing three D audio room, uh, and then the lights would go on, and you'd be underwater with the whales uh, while they would swim. They'd be swimming. Um, and it's such a surreal experience. I'm telling you, I, I had goosebumps. I was emotional coming out wow. of that room. It wow. was so real. Um, and from within that room to another room, they would, uh, for example, a savanna, and you'd you'd see um, uh, lions, and you'd see a lion hunting, for example. 
um, um, and you'd have commentary on on educational uh, material on how on how that ecosystem thrives through that hunt, and that hunt creates um, this uh, this environment that's perfect for these animals to just to coexist in, in, in that in that atmosphere. And then you'd stop for a second, and then you'd go look at a zoo, and you'd go look at the most miserable, uh, depressed um, bear or 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 lion laying down and being fed uh, meat uh, as if it was natural. And there's zero entertainment in it. There's zero education in it. Um, it's 100% cruel. It's 100% unnecessary. And frankly, it is one of the dumbest industries that ever existed, and it should it should die tomorrow. Um, so if we were to step into the 22nd uh, um, 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 century and actually start thinking about how can we evolve uh, this disgusting industry and create something that's suitable for the environment and to the year that we're in and make it more educational for people, it'd be perfect. Yeah. Give you a better experience than what we know zoos to be like. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, that I, I really hope that that is the future that uh, puts zoos as we know it to end and aquariums. Not not all of them, and granted, I'm, I'm I'm going to be honest with you. I think, for example, zoos like the San Diego Zoo is super important for 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 rehabilitation um, uh, for these animals and everything, and they've got a great program for for uh, for uh, releasing them back into the wild. Um, they got a great medical program for them too. So there are not all zoos are created equal. Okay, I didn't know that. Uh, I thought all zoos are no, no. So San Diego, one of the famous ones. One of the famous ones, exactly. They yeah. do it in a, in a better way. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, SeaWorld, although SeaWorld is it's, it's it's dumb. There's there's zero reason for for SeaWorld to exist uh, other than entertainment, uh, other than entertainment. Period. Um, They've well, had accidents. Oh hell yeah, I've, I've seen. Uh, <laughs> so I was on um, I was on Instagram and I saw a story of um, uh, one of the orcas who um, killed one of the trainers, and. Um, uh, I had, I mean, I did comment, but regardless of uh, of of, uh, of of what people th- thought of my comment, the reality is, I feel sad for the uh, for the trainer, for her to lose her life unnecessarily, but I'm not surprised that that happened, and that's the reality of it. I'm just not surprised that that happened because that's just not natural. You're taking uh, a whale that's that's in effect um, in the ocean and putting it into what in effect is a bathtub. Uh, size um, um, environment for it to be in for the rest of its life. And then that's, that, that, that doesn't sound right. And I'm not surprised that these, these, um, these mammals do go crazy once in a while or do go cr- crazy eventually. So, you know, SeaWorld shouldn't exist. SeaWorld is a disgusting organization. And if they just... Uh, Stop with the uh, with the capturing of the orcas and the dolphins and just do all the other entertainment stuff that they're doing. Fine, they'd be great. But other than that, they're just a disgusting organization, and I'm glad they're not here. Um, I'll, I'll call them out publicly for that. Um, I was hoping that documentary would would close them down eventually. I thought so because their stock price just tanked. It did, um, it did but just um, not not enough. They're still floating. Oh yeah, I mean they're owned by BlackRock, so. Um, Blackstone or Blackrock? I think it was Blackstone. One of the two. Um, I keep getting mixed deep, up with the uh, deep pockets. Yeah, well, with with one of the mineral black yeah. minerals that, that, yeah, that the yeah, companies, yeah. whatever, yeah. whatever it is. Um, um, to us, uh, they've got deep pockets. They can sustain it. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm happy to see that people are waking up um, and calling these, um, these these organizations out. And hopefully that'll end, and then they will create uh, a better environment for us too, for for us to, in terms of um, entertainment-wise. I mean, I, I'd be more interested to see something in 3D um, that can teach me something totally. rather than just seeing a whale jump up and down coming out of the water. What's what's so interesting about that? Yeah. There's nothing, especially if it plays with your senses. You're saying that you know when you go down, you 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 feel the cold oh, yeah. or you get the wind. That um, that really almost like builds the environment of which that animal lives in, so you mm-hmm. get to feel what they're what they're what they're going through. Oh, I yeah. really hope that's zoos 2.0. Like I won't take my son to current zoos. Mm-hmm. I'm just against our policy. Yeah. But if it changes to what you're saying, I think there's there's, there's a bright future there. Could be us. great. Yeah. Yeah. Inshallah. Um, <clears throat> you lost your mother last year. Um, 
I wanted to ask you about her, Allah mm. Um What was one of your favorite memories uh, of her or something that she taught you that stays with you a lot, Prince Khalid? I'm sorry. Um, I thought it'd be easier to talk, talk about this. Um, <laughs> um, I think one of the most beautiful things that I've ever learned from a mom was um, um, humility. Um, I remember growing up with uh, growing up in our old house, Perial, and um, her walking around around the house and uh, knowing the gardeners by name, knowing the operator of for uh, the phone operator by name, um, going inside their uh, their their quarters and making sure that they're comfortable, that everything that they wanted was there. Um, also, not to be messed with at all. If she, if someone, um, if someone from her close friends or anything, or even just someone from the outside, um, did something that would hurt her in some way, she definitely let them know. So it was definitely vocal about it. She was, she would never be shy about it. Um, and um, so, so honesty and transparency was something that she taught me. Um, yeah, um, I mean, every everything that I've ever been uh, is contributed to her. Um, Business-wise, God bless him, my dad for sure. Um, Human-wise, not to say he's not human. Obviously, he is, and he taught me a lot of um, a lot of things to to understand about being uh, being a person and being a man. But from my mom, just um, just understanding that uh, people have feelings, respect their feelings. Um, be nice to them, but definitely uh, stand up and uh, and be vocal about things that you don't you don't like. Um, one of the most valuable things she taught me was no. Learn when to say no. I I, I am horrible at no, in saying no. Um, I read somewhere recently that uh, watch your life improve the more you say no yeah. to things. And uh, it's as if she and she I'm sure she didn't read that, but I know that she lived that. And she taught me that really, really well. And um, yeah, so um, I get to come to Jeddah often. Uh, she used to, she has uh, she has a house here, um, so I get to come here as often as I want to now. Um, I used to come here when she was around, um, hang out with her, obviously here as much as I can. Uh, but now, just walking in there for the first time, I think it was two weeks ago. Yeah, I was destroyed for a good. Uh, for a good two hours. It was pretty, it's because it's, it's, he's everywhere. That was your first you know time I mean? in the house. And first time, yeah. And, um, but yeah, I get to go there now and it's, and every time I go into that house, it's as if it's the first time. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's, yeah, I need to have a breath and just remember, because it's just, it, it's, um, it's something that you don't, that I, I mean, I hate to say, I hope people don't go through with this, but the reality is people are going to go through this. It's life. Yeah, it's life. So, um, it's, um, it's definitely a feeling that I don't wish upon anyone, but it's a beautiful feeling knowing that I'll see you soon, later, whenever the heck it yeah. is, but I'll see you soon. I'm sure she's very proud of the person you've become. I love what you stand for. So many of these topics that we went through, uh, I think uh, many, many people around the world, if they were to incorporate one or two of them, they'd live a better life. And, uh, you know, seeing the person that you have become, I'm sure she was very proud of you. I, 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 yeah, I lost my cheerleader. Allah Your father, no introduction needed, um, one of the most prominent, best businessmen in the world. Uh, and I'm not saying that because you're here, it's, it's public knowledge. What was one of the best things he's ever taught you? Trust but verify is definitely something that he taught me. And I, I, lived, I lived this to, the, to this day. I was stung a few times. And... Um, uh, from not living by that rule. I think that's one of the rules that I always uh, I always uh, keep in the back of my mind through any dealing with with uh, either friends or uh, acquaintances or business associates or partners. It's just that's the uh, the the the, um, uh, the rule that I live by. And I think that really served me well uh, throughout the years uh, when I listened to it. 
when I disregarded it, I got stung got a few stung. times. Yeah. yeah. Trust, but verify. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, when you're just too nice, you seem like a very nice guy. I've been accused of being too nice. We turn a blind eye to, you know, it won't happen to me. These guys, uh, I trust them yeah. or, you know, they, 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 they have my best interest in heart. Oh, yeah. But life, the world, uh, experience is the best teacher. Oh, you God, yeah. Humble Honestly, you. I wouldn't take away one thing that happened to me in the past uh, to date. I wouldn't take away one thing. I, honestly, it's um, it's been such a good experience to understand and to feel and to learn from and then to grow from and then to be who um, who I wanted who I want to be and who I aspire for my daughters to uh, to look up to at the end of the day. It's super important for me. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, everything I do is is to to have to give them a better life, to um, to make my country proud, uh, and to make my family proud. And not necessarily all in that order, but uh, sometimes I don't like uh, my daughters that day because they're giving me a hard time. So my country comes first, and other times, nope, they come first. <laughs> it doesn't matter. But um, as long as I'm living with uh, with um, with the integrity and the um, the um, the humility that I was taught uh, by my family to, um, to to live by. That's all I can do. Values, Prince Khalid. Values are just you know uh, um, care about myself a little more, and I actually learned that during COVID. Uh, um, I had a lot of free time, like we all did. Um, and I started reflecting on on me and uh, thinking about me and uh, what I can do for myself a lot more. So I started reading a lot more about um, about uh, about um, um, about being present uh, and um, and um, and not expecting, um, you know, aiming for uh, the best, but not expecting the best all the time. Um, I started reading so many really interesting books, The Power of Now, um, A New Tomorrow. So it's these type of books that really, really helped me just grow and just become uh, the person that I am now. And I think one of the most valuable things that I can take away from, if I learned anything from COVID, it, it'll be um, uh, just focus on myself first. Uh, you can't go wrong. It's not selfish. Um, it's, it's, uh, you owe yourself a responsibility to yourself uh, to become a better person. So I started sleeping more. Yeah. Uh, I used to pride myself just saying, I only slept four hours, five hours. I'd, I'd be miserable. Uh, I, was gonna, I was just going to throw an F-bomb there. So. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> Sleep is important. Oh, my God, yeah. So I, I, I regularly get uh, six to seven hours, uh, seven and a half hours maybe of sleep. Um, my whoop tells me uh, if I'm uh, resting enough, uh, if I'm putting enough strain when it comes to exercise. Is that what it does? Does it tell you if you needed to get more sleep? Oh, yeah. It... it tells you how much how much sleep you're going to need so that you can perform this way tomorrow. Super interesting. And it tells you to sleep nine hours sometimes, by the way, which I love. Thank you. So there, <laughs> there's, there's an excuse. I'm not making this up. <laughs> I've been on the fence and getting one, but that's an interesting This feat. changed my life. Whoop changed my life to the better. I, I, I became more active. I became more mindful. I became more um, more um, in, uh, more interested into understanding the data that it gives out to me and just uh, interpreting it in a way that how I can perform for the next day or two or three. Um, honestly, it changed. My, I'm not. I'm not an ambassador or anything. I don't. I'll never make anything from them. But I totally am a, a, a believer in this, and I've already convinced two or three friends of mine to to get this. Um, and I would. I would 100 percent. Um, um, endorse it if you would. It, it's it changed my life, honestly. Does it come in black? It comes in all colors. We need to get a couple of those, honestly. I've seen <laughs> it with a couple of buddies, yeah. um, but I never understood the mechanics of it. Yeah. I mean, I mean, there's a tech out there that tells you, you, sir, need to sleep X amount tonight. We've never had that before. Oh, yeah, exactly. And sleep yeah. is crucial. Oh, 100%. If I want to perform, forget... Uh, if, um, um, sports and all that. If I wanted to perform with a clear mind and make good decisions when it comes to business, I need to have a good amount of sleep. And I'm having five or four hours of sleep doesn't cut it for me. Now, granted, it might do for some people. God bless y'all. But me, it doesn't. Um, I, I'm I'm a functioning human being when it comes to six, no, six and a half, seven, seven and a half hours of sleep. That's a sweet spot yeah. right there. Yeah. yeah. Interesting information.
See, see, these are the these are the kind of episodes where um, that that I enjoy, where it actually I get to benefit as well from yeah, it. Yeah, you know, yeah. there's some major takeaways, <laughs> uh, and one of them is uh, is Whoop. Um, so I listen. Uh, your time is precious. Uh, I have one more thing I want to bounce off you um, before we wrap up, Prince Khalid. Um, it's going to be business related, sure. up and coming entrepreneurs. The space is hot locally. You see a lot of startups, uh, you know, accelerator programs in Kaust and many other universities. What advice do you have for these young entrepreneurs, future business owners? You touched on trust but verify. Fantastic. I love that. Is there anything else you'd want to give these future business owners in Saudi? Start a business that you're interested in, start a business that will solve a real problem. And don't focus on starting a business because it's your passion. And that might sound strange, um, but um, someone's passion uh, might be something and the market would be calling for something else. And if you start a business for your passion and the market isn't there, I don't care how much passion you, you have, you're going to fail. Yeah, so, um, so you have to start a business that, that's going to solve an actual real world problem or even um, not even solve a problem, but uh, but um, uh, fill in a void that uh, that your business can uh, can uh, can fill. So uh, that's that would be my number one uh, concern is definitely start a business that's um, uh, that's going to solve a real problem and not necessarily start a business that's just just because it's your passion. Uh, passion projects are just that. Business projects are the ones that make money. So looking for solutions. I mean, for the longest time, the most miserable thing in the world. Uh, was the taxi system. Yeah. Sorry, it drove me nuts. Yeah, yeah. And now Uber is one of the more pleasant experiences oh, yeah. in the world. Airbnb yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. These guys looked for solutions. They don't own a single asset. They connected the consumer with the end <laughs> with the product. Oh, yeah. And look at how those two companies have 100%. Fared. Yeah. WeWork was great. I mean, until until he, um, uh, the CEO, was was running it down the drain. But uh, WeWork had a great business, uh, business model. But did, they needed to tweak it a little more. They yeah. just didn't. Um, did you see the documentary? I did not yet. I mean, it's on my... Wanting to see it as well. Yeah, me I too. A, I heard it's a good one. I heard it was really good too. Yeah. Um, so they've they've kind of went under, or are they? They they haven't gone under. They've they've they're about ninety percent less of their nah maybe less maybe eighty uh, percent less of their valuation has been cut down by eighty seventy percent. Um, the CEO wasn't doing a, the best the best job apparently. Um, but um, they're still operating. It's just that they're a lot smaller than what they were. They were. Yeah, which is great because that just means that um, uh, this is the real valuation now, and they get to build from there as opposed to build on just hype. Yeah, you don't want you, yeah. So that's exactly what um, what Uber was going through, and um, and WeWork's going through. Um, but um, companies like um, Airbnb and companies like, like Uber, they solved a huge issue. Huge. I mean, honestly, every time I travel to uh, to um, San Francisco, I'd, I'd go there every two months or so. Um, I'd go Airbnb. I would not go in a Four Seasons. Mm -hmm. I would not go to a hotel. I wouldn't go to any of the top hotels or smaller You'd hotels. Go Airbnb. Airbnb is so much easier. I, I cook, so I mean, so also it's really simple. So I can make my own food. Um, but I Airbnb, and it's so easy. Um, it's. Um, I mean, honestly, to me, it was a lifesaver. It's just a lot easier yeah. just going through lobbies with people and everything. You go through a house, and it's your house and, and everything. House. Or yeah, yeah gives you that parts. homey aspect, that exactly. homey vibe. Yeah. And if you don't like the one you're at, you know, you can choose another one. Another oh, you one. can. Every time yeah. you're just, yeah. uh, it's a genius idea. It is. It is. I mean, Uber is the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Uber was just a brilliant idea. I used to go to New York all the time and Lord help me going to the yellow cab. Yellow cab. No, it's I can't disaster. do that. Oh, I would always, God. nine times out of 10, I'm fighting with the cab, with the cabbie. Oh, hundred percent. And, and, and have your phone drop in between the cushions at the back of the, uh, the, uh, the, um, um, yellow cab. Yeah. That's you, the last time you'll see it. You can, you can pay me to reach down yeah. there and get it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh God. Yeah. But, um, it was miserable. Oh my God. So yeah. it solved a real problem when it comes to at least New York. But, mm -hmm. um, but, um, and again, these are first world uh, issues that would have in here, alhamdulillah. Correct. But um, they solved the real issues. Mm. And then, and I think they also created um, uh, opportunity for people who wanted a second job uh, for for them to start yeah. making money. Yeah, so that, I think that's that, also a good thing. Great, great. Yeah. And that's not, and that, that, Crosses first, second, and third world. Yes, that's that's, that's, 100%, that's what I like about that. hundred um, percent. Yeah, and that's where the 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 creator economy is happening when it comes to here in the region. When it comes to creative economy, uh, the creative economy, um, and having them on YouTube and having them starting their podcasts and having them start their own businesses, 
it's it, it, it's the doors are wide open right, right now yeah you know so it's, it's decentralized it's exactly yeah. Yeah. um I, another question came up so i lied about that last one no no one. no it's okay um just the forecast do you see what what industries uh, or sectors do you see going up over the next decade and what do you see going down besides I mean, the automobile because that's obviously clear yeah i think honestly i want to automobile only if it's an ev if they're ev they're going to make it if not it's the future gonna, yeah 100 percent um when it comes to uh, let's say this region i think um, um, um education technology is going to be super important um i think fintech is going to be super interesting here in the region um i think internationally um i think we're looking at uh, just a bunch of decentralized um um um, um, um uh, industries that are going to come out through web 3.0 and what's going to happen uh, with that i'm not too big on meta we already talked about that and all that stuff crypto uh, crypto i'm pretty big on I, I i love crypto and i understand the underlying technology behind blockchain is where it's at um uh, the 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 utility backed tokens are where it's at um the the garbage uh coins that are out there stay away from um, um people are going to try to make money here and they're just if you're going to put any money in there you put 10 per, maybe five percent 10 percent of your net worth in there and just leave it alone and just walk away and just, just have a position yeah and just focus on actual real world issues yeah. uh and, and problems and, and problem solving yeah uh, but uh, cryptocurrency is big for, for me. It's it's super big. I think the uh, again the underlying technology behind that is super important. I think that's going to solve a lot of the issues that we're having right now when it comes to um, let's let's just call one one example of it um, um, uh, wire transfers between bank oh, between God, yeah. uh, accounts and yeah. banks and everything. That's going to be a huge uh, problem uh, solved when it comes to uh, Web 3.0 and, uh, and cryptocurrency. Um, the underlying technology behind um, e, um, uh, e contracts super important also. So you have uh, contracts that are backed by blockchain, Blocked, so you yeah. won't have any uh, fraud uh, anymore. Super interesting, and it's very trans uh, uh, transparent. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, you can go. And it's the most auditable um, audit auditable um, um, industry out there. It's just public for people to see. So it's not an issue for people when it comes to all this garbage when you hear about money laundering. Does it happen? Sure. When it comes to NFTs and all that garbage that's that's happening right now. But NFTs as a um, as a concept is super, it's super important. And I think it's going to solve a huge issue that we're going to have in the next, I don't know, five to seven years. But for now, if you're interested in having a board ape yacht club, then you're not the person I need to talk to. <laughs> Does that, I mean, it leads me to ask, Cash is is paper cash something that you see soon to be obsolete? Oh yeah, hundred percent. I do okay. see that. I do see that. I don't think I don't see the value of having paper cash anymore. Um, dirty things come from behind it. Oh yeah, hundred percent. Un untraceable, untraceable things, and you can have you can have your money right on your phone right now, and uh, and right now you're having um, your um, your government official your your um, your government documents on your iPhone right now through wallet, yeah. um, through the Apple Wallet thing. So um, uh, app, I mean. So uh, these uh, these type of um, of solutions are definitely there, and they're here to stay. It's just that governments just need to adopt it um, very quickly. And Saudi has been the number one country when it comes to adopting technology. Alhamdulillah. I mean, um, the push that our government has had to mandate um, um, IT being um, inside of every min ministry. We're seeing the fruits of it right now. So advanced. It's so advanced. Yeah, yeah. So ahead. We're ahead of so many Western countries. It's not yeah. even funny. Yeah. No, it's the truth. It's yep. the truth. I mean, I've had Western people tell me who live here. Yeah. We are so advanced. The Tawakkana platform and and yeah. the Atamarna and, and everything yep. to do with anything that comes out of uh, the government as far as apps are concerned. It's mm -hmm. just... It's just ridiculous. So far ahead of the curve. Oh yeah. Venmo is popular in the states. Isn't so popular here or something. But I guess STC Pay is kind of it's the same thing. Fintech exactly, now. Yeah. yeah. So it's STC yeah. Pay. But I think we need a little more than STC Pay. Yeah. yeah. I think STC Pay is 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 is, um, is kind of creating this own monopoly here, and I think that needs to change really yeah. quickly. And we need to have uh, three, four, five other Correct. companies come here and, and actually, yeah. And that's why I think fintech is going to be huge here. Totally. Yeah. Good call. Well, Prince Khalid, man, thank you so no, much no, absolute for pleasure, everything thank you, you have Allah. given us. Uh, so many nice takeaways, gems, learnings, advice that uh, I know you did not spare us. <laughs> um, is is uh, did we manage to get everything out of you that we uh, that we could have? Is there anything that we that you feel that we missed? Um, anything you want to leave us with, or are you happy with everything? 
No, well, look, uh, I'm I'm super happy. Thank you very much for having me. Um, it's Thank been a coming. really fun uh, conversation, um, and I love the, the the flow of it. Honestly, it wasn't just the shoot questions and then and then okay, you can leave now. You're an easy person to talk no. to. <laughs> Thank you very much. Serious. Like, have you? So um, I, I can't say anything. Thank you very much for having me. I had a really good time, well, and I hope if all the listeners or the watchers I'm have sure. a great time too. I'm sure they will. Thank you so much for making time for us. We uh, we're gonna watch your your moves. I mean, uh, we're gonna hopefully learn, and I'm gonna try to go back vegan. I'm not just saying that <laughs> because you're here. I had a great two weeks, and I want to see if I can stretch it to a month, if not further. And uh, and thanks for everything that you do for us in the sporting world of Saudi. I mean, I know it's not easy. I know it's a tall order, and there's a lot of change that uh, that has to happen in short time. But we appreciate and we acknowledge the efforts that you go through. So honestly, for me, I, I have to thank you for what you're doing there. Thank you very much. That's so nice of you. And I honestly, um, none of this could be possible without the amazing. Th- I'm not even. I'm not just saying that. None of this would be possible without the amazing team that we have. Uh, the Sports for All Federation. We have an amazing managing director, uh, Shaim Hassani. We have amazing directors throughout all, all the um, uh, the divi- the um, uh, the, part- the departments that we have. Um, they're doing an amazing job, and they're doing this job day in and day out, uh, morning and night. They, uh, they're not just clocking in from nine to five, nine to four, and just saying, okay, see, I'll see you tomorrow. They're literally working uh, throughout, throughout the day to make this uh, this um, this goal a reality. You can and, see that. And yeah, everything that uh, the Sports for All, uh, any success that you've seen in the Sports for All is literally the entire team's um, contribution, not mine. Amazing. Nothing like working with a great team. Yep, that's so true. Wishing you all the best, Ms. Khalid. Thanks again for taking time. Thank you. Allah Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome, man. Thank you very much. That was great.